is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, and good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the Population Health Research Network's webinar Wednesday, which is kindly hosted by the ARDC. Uh, these lunchtime webinars showcase researchers who've used the PHRN network to assist them with their research. And over the next two weeks, we're highlighting research that uses cross-sectoral linked data and focuses on issues beyond health alone. So this week, I'm delighted to introduce to you Professor Stuart Kinner and Dr. Jesse Young from the Justice Health Unit in the Centre for Health Equity at the University of Melbourne. And Stuart and Jesse will be talking on the topic using multi-sectoral data linkage to inform whole of government responses for people who experience social exclusion, challenges and opportunities. So welcome to you both and I'll hand over to Stuart and Jesse. Thank you very much, Felicity. Um, so maybe just for a start here, just some housekeeping. So I'm gonna go through a few um, uh, slides in the beginning here, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Stuart to talk a little bit more targeted at um, uh, kind of a youth justice component. I'm gonna be dealing with primarily um, justice health among adults. Um, and then I'm just gonna say a few uh, words to um, wrap things up at the end. Um, so thank you very much for everybody attending. Um, my name is uh, Jesse Young, and I'm an NHMRC Emerging Leadership Fellow of the Justice Health Unit at the University of Melbourne. Um, and Stuart is gonna be controlling the slides today. So um, Stuart, if we could go on to the next slide. Okay, uh, just some housekeeping again as just disclosure. So um, there's the relevant grant and research support for this program of work. Um, and I sit on a, a relevant committee, as you can see there. Uh, and apart from those mentioned, um, I have no actual or uh, potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to start with a, a statement from a fairly well-known member of um, the South African community, Nelson Mandela, um, who, uh, I quote, stated, no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails. A nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. And for me, um, this isn't a statement that's specific to uh, jails particularly, I've always thought of this statement as a statement around inequality in society. Of one thing uh, that we know is that jails um, tend to um, increase with people in them when inequality increases, and so they are strictly a marker um, of inequality. Um, and that's kind of, um, as you'll see, uh, this uh, presentation really it deals with extreme inequality. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and when we talk about inequality, um, one, of the, one of the things that we really know is that social exclusion is um, a marker of extreme inequality. Uh, and there was a, um, series in the Lancet about three years ago that went into um, what's called in the principles of inclusion health. And what that actually means is they looked at socially excluded groups and the health um, uh, profiles of these groups. Specifically, they looked at four groups, people with a history of incarceration, um, people with mental illness or substance use disorders, um, homeless people, and sex workers. And they also um, mentioned other groups for consideration, as you can see there. Next slide, please. Um, and so Inclusion Health is really a research service and policy agenda. And um, as I stated before, its aim is to prevent social and health inequality, um, not only people in extremely poor health, but as a result of multimorbidity, marginalization and poverty. Um, this extreme uh, uh, poor health due to social exclusion um, and capture the full extent of inequalities for those experienced the social exclusion. Um, what, what it stated is basically, next slide, please. 
what this um, uh, series kind of concluded is that there's a place for multi-sectoral data linkage in um, kind of redressing this extreme um, uh, morbidity due to social exclusion. So I quote, they concluded data linkage methods could be used to match data from services that work with inclusion health groups with vital registration data, electronic health records, and existing disease surveillance systems. These linked data sets would facilitate systematic estimates of mortality and morbidity over time and help to measure the effect of interventions in these groups. Um, so this was really um, kind of a, a groundbreaking statement in this kind of inclusion health um, movement um, and situated data linkage at, you know, kind of one of the forefront of um, uh, creating this evidence to uh, resolve or, or redress inequality. Next slide, please. Um, and when we look at, and when the series looked at inclusion health, um, they really found that it goes beyond just measures of deprivation. So they looked at um, uh, standardized mortali mortality ratios comparing the most uh, deprived areas to the least deprived areas in Wales and England. Um, and they came up with, um, as you can see there, for males three and for females two. Whereas when they looked at socially excluded groups, the four groups that I mentioned, um, they came up with much more uh, dramatic um, standardized mortality ratios. Next slide, please. And in a rev review of the standardized mortality ratios, um, looking at the causes of these things. You probably can't see this, but this is a, a tree map, essentially. And what you can see there is that the standardized mortality ratios for socially excluded groups are in the order of magnitude higher um, than those in the general community, um, especially for things such as injury. Um, and then you can see external causes there um, and infectious disease. Uh, the other striking thing about this tree map is that um, in the bottom right hand corner there's a whole host of things that we have very little evidence for um, so there's still extreme gaps um, in our in our knowledge around uh, the mortality of these groups next slide please um, so the key recommendations from this um, series in the Lancet was that, um, you know, we need improved routine data to drive policy change in this area. Uh, so they recommended multi-sectoral data linkage, which we'll go into in a moment, um, and matching data from services that work with these groups uh, to existing routinely collected data. So um, I went over those three uh, components of that previously. Next slide, please. Um, and so one of the things they mentioned was that to develop capacity for population data linkage to routinely ascertain social exclusion group membership. Um, and critically, they, they recommend a move from social exclusion group membership as the sampling frame um, to one which it's a population-based sampling frame and social exclusion uh, becomes the exposure. Um, and that would enable uh, the generation of estimates of mortality and morbidity to affect a whole of government public health response. Next slide, please. Um, so the rest of my part of this presentation, I'm going to be looking at a, a specific um, socially excluded group, and that would be adults in contact with the criminal justice system. And, and this whole um, component of justice health is really a case for multi-agency care and information sharing. And one of the um, articles that really shaped my thinking in this area is, is an article by DiPietro and Klingemeyer where they um, stated, and I quote, providers and administrators in both the criminal justice system and the community not only share a common set of patients, they also share important public health goals. And this is one of the first opportunities I had to read something um, where they really um, connected uh, justice health and the broader public health goals um, rather than considering it was a setting, you know, uh, uh, custody was a setting that lied separate or in a siloed location. Um, this was really talking about the integration of both these um, systems into one public health goal. Next uh, 
slide, please. So since about um, 2012, I've been involved in uh, this project here, um, which is the Health After Release from Prison Cohort Study. Um, and this is really, I'm going to just briefly go through the design here. It's a really innovative study, and it was one that Stuart Kinner um, initiated uh, back in uh, July uh, 2008, um, whereby him and a team of um, very intrepid individuals set out to interview people um, before they were released from prison. So that was within six weeks um, uh, of expected release. They administered a baseline interview and then at great um, effort and, and resources, they managed to follow up these individuals with an interview at one month post-release prison, again at three months and again at six months post-release. Next slide, please. And then over um, a period of years, uh, Stuart and, and, and myself and others have been um, a part of uh, a program of research that has now linked in uh, administrative data to this survey resource. So um, it's hard to read here, but I'll just go through the different sources. Um, we've linked in correctional records, uh, death registry records, PBS, MBS, so pharmaceutical or primary care claims, um, intellectual disability notifications in WA, and I'll, I'll go into the separation of Queensland and WA in this whole thing. Um, notifiable conditions, so infectious disease records, alcohol and other drug treatment, ambulatory mental health care contacts, and hospital admissions, ED presentations, and ambulance attendances. So this has created a wealth of information to understand um, not only the health concerns, but also uh, the system integration uh, of these individuals and their health trajectories through these services. Um, and uh, so basically what I'm going to go on to describe is evidence that we've generated in the Queensland cohort. That was the 1,325 adults released from prison in Queensland. Um, just to note that this has also been replicated now in Western Australia. Um, the total cohort is now about 2,700 adults and um, we're just uh, uh, going through the uh, data management and cleaning process for the Western Australia linked data. Next slide, please. So these data have allowed, um, gratefully have allowed myself to learn quite a bit about um, what happens after release from prison for these individuals. So this is a paper that I led um, recently uh, looking at the key causes um, and kind of resource indicators in acute care after release from prison. And in the left there, you can see that um, the primary cause for both ED presentation and hospital inpatient um, uh, is actually uh, inpatient separations is actually um, injury, um, with the second uh, cause, second leading cause being mental and behavioral disorders. Um, and next slide, please. And so that prompts us to think about injury after release from prison and and not only that, but what um, kind of people's mental health pro profiles, um, how, how that was related. So we did, conducted a further study where we looked at um, the relationship between uh, mental health disorders and uh, injury after release from prison. And we basically looked at four mutually exclusive groups. So people who had a dual diagnosis of mental illness and uh, substance use disorder. Um, those people who had only indications of a mental illness only, um, those who had substance use disorder only, and our comparison group was those um, with no indication of a mental disorder prior to release from prison. And as you can see from this graph here, um, we, we saw quite a profound spike in injury um, within 30 days of release, but eight out of 10 of those in injuries were um, in the mental or in the dual diagnosis group. Um, and then we, because a lot of the literature in this area has looked into um, poisoning or drug related injuries, um, overdose, if you will, uh, we 
wanted to know whether that spike that we're seeing in the dual diagnosis was due to um, drug-related injury or injury from other cause. So in the, in the right-hand panel there, you can see that we modeled that out. Um, and what, what we found is that nine out of 10 uh, drug-related injuries were in the dual diagnosis group um, uh, within 30 days. Uh, and the other striking thing is that eight out of 10 injuries across the entire follow-up period were actually due to um, injury other than drug-related. Uh, so one thing that that really told us is that, you know, uh, this is an opportunity to um, target overdose prevention to a very uh, select group, uh, and you can kind of target nine out of 10 of the, the kind of morbidity there. Um, and the other thing it told us is basically um, overdose isn't a panacea here. Um, you know, uh, eight out of 10 injuries are from other causes. And, and, and you know, what I know of the uh, literature is that we actually know very little about targeted uh, injury prevention for all other causes in marginalized groups, such as people released from prison. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Derek. Um, the other thing we uh, have been able to do with this uh, line of research is really look at um, some of the um, kind of definitional uh, issues. So this was a, a paper led by Claire Keane, a, a, a intrepid master's student of ours, um, who, who looked at um, the definition of fatal overdose and how that affects um, patterns. In the overdose literature, often um, uh, overdose is restricted to strictly uh, opioid um, non-fatal overdose. Um, however, Claire wanted to investigate whether, uh, you know, including all um, codings of overdose changes um, basically the extent of the burden that we capture. Um, and as you can see here, um, there are um, increased ascertainment of overdose over time if you do include all non-fatal overdose through administrative records rather than strict uh, restricting it to uh, opioid overdose. Next slide. Um, and it, maybe this illustrates it even clearer. If you see the bottom, um, the bottom bar there, so we had about two years of follow-up. Um, and if you restrict uh, your overdose definition to opioid, you only pick up about one third, just over one third of non-fatal overdoses over two two-year period. Um, so that's a really striking finding around, um, you know, the the extent of the burden of overdose outside our traditional view of opioid overdose. Next slide, please. The other thing that um, one of the previous uh, papers that we've published in this area um, really uh, confirmed for us is, as you can see there, there's, a, there's an outlier on that um, particular plot. And um, that is self-harm amongst the dual diagnosis group. Um, and so we became very interested in that particular finding after that paper. Next slide, please. And so we conducted a follow-up paper. We wanted to find out um, what happens, basically the care trajectories of people who contact acute services after release from prison um, for self-harm. Um, and so I'm not gonna explain this. This is basically a schematic whereby we looked at people who contacted ambulance um, or presented to the ED or um, presented to a hospital or were admitted to a hospital um, after release from prison. And um, we followed their trajectory through that acute care system. So whether they came into ambulance and then went to ED and then were admitted and then were discharged from the hospital or if they walked from you know, the ambulance attendants or if um, they just presented to the ED and were discharged there, we, we were able to link all those um, uh, acute care sources together and follow the trajectory through those systems. And what we were interested in is essentially um, the international guidelines for self-harm aftercare state that um, all individuals who present to acute care for self-harm uh, 
should receive specialist mental health care um, within seven days of discharge from acute care. Um, so we then had the ability to link in using the MBS for um, psychiatric consultations through uh, primary care in Australia. And then also um, we had linkage with the ambulatory care, ambulatory care mental health, um, sorry, ambulatory mental health care system. Um, we looked at basically how soon or how soon after um, discharge from acute care, these individuals then receive that um, recommended uh, self-harm aftercare. Next slide. And so when we modeled that out, uh, what you can see from the graph here is as that line goes down, that's people accessing care, okay? Um, and so the seven day marker is there and what you can see is only about half of all individuals discharged from acute care um, receive the recommended self-harm after care. We also were curious whether um, modeling it out to 30 days would um, kind of change uh, that uh, proportion drastically and it only increased by about 5% at 30 days. So essentially, if you don't go early, um, it's unlikely that you actually reach that self-harm after care. Next slide, please. The other thing that we've been able to do, uh, which is fairly unique, is because um, we had very comprehensive baseline survey data linked in with these linked data, we've been able to um, look at um, how ascertaining certain things with survey data and then linked administrative data, how those two things overlap. Um, so here's a, a study led by Rowan Borschman, um, which I was involved in, uh, basically looking at the overlap of self-reported um, uh, self-harm uh, history and also um, self-harm history ascertained from linked administrative data. And what was striking about this is that, um, so if you can see in the right hand panel there, um, we basically looked at four groups or created four groups. Those, uh, the true positive group was basically people who had said, yes, I have um, had a self-harm uh, a history of self-harm from the survey data or when they were asked, and then also had one, an evidence of that in their medical records. And then false negative was basically people who said, no, I haven't um, in the survey data, but also um, when we looked back in uh, medical records, they had had a, a evidence of self-harm. Unconfirmed positive is those who said, yes, I have, but we couldn't find any evidence in the actual medical records. And then our control group was uh, unconfirmed negative, which basically are people who said, no, they haven't. And um, when we look back in their medical records, we couldn't find any evidence of that. Um, and what, what the take home message here is that um, the false negative group is at um, four times um, increased hazard of uh, subsequent uh, self-harm. Uh, so basically, if you if you don't um, utilize multiple um, sources of information uh, to ascertain um, self-harm what you could be missing an opportunity for prevention um, and it was very similar to the true positive in terms of um, the adjusted hazard of future self-harm next slide please And again, we've replicated that um, with uh, uh, looking at overdose as well. So Claire Keane did a very similar uh, replication of that previous study, looking at um, overdose, uh, self-reported overdose versus um, medically verified or, or, or overdose ascertained from um, medical records and came up with a, a very similar finding, as you can see there. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that you can do with um, the linked data in this area um, is look at health system expenditure um, from a variety of sources. So um, here's a study led by Catherine Snow, um, who basically uh, 
looked at um, the health system expenditure within one year of release um, and uh, looked at, uh, again, the way mental health profile uh, affects that uh, particular expenditure. And what you can see here is one across the board expenditure is quite high amongst this group. Um, it is disproportionately uh, incurred at the kind of acute care level. So you can see emergency department and hospital costs there um, account for well over half of the expenditure within one year. And on the right panel there, you can see that uh, there's disproportionately high costs uh, incurred amongst people with a dual diagnosis. Next uh, slide, please. Um, and then just a, a, a glimpse into some of the uh, future projects that we've gone in the pipeline here. Uh, here's a project um, where we're, we're basically conducting a, a pilot randomized trial um, of a, uh, an intervention to maintain smoking abstinence after release from smoke-free prisons. Um, so for those who don't know, um, all prisons in Victoria um, at this point are smoke-free, um, which means that you have prison-initiated uh, abstinence for the most part, um, which is one of the hardest things to achieve is uh, abstinence from smoking among, amongst marginalized groups often. Um, it's been achieved in prison. However, currently there is no support um, for individuals to maintain that smoking abstinence after release from prison. So we basically constructed an RCT to look at an intervention that not only um, is applied pre-release uh, from prison, but also uh, is applied after the release from prison. Um, the point here is that we're using linked data to evaluate long-term uh, outcomes from this intervention. Um, so not only are we going to get a good idea from kind of survey data uh, about how this intervention was tracking in the short term, we're also linking it in um, to you know MBS and PBS data um, to understand how um, this intervention may have a broader uh, effect on these individuals' health and also look at things like access to you know, evidence-based pharmacotherapy, et cetera. Next slide, please. And at this point, I'm gonna pass over to Stuart and Stuart's gonna go into uh, how, what this all means for youth justice. Thanks, Jesse. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll keep it quite brief, but I, I wanted to just build on what Jesse's spoken about and talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing, uh, adapting some of those approaches to study the health of young people who move through the youth system in Australia. Um, again, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and we're very fortunate to have received quite a bit of NHMRC funding for some of this work. We've got two current NHMRC project grants. Um, to support some of the work I'm going to talk about here. So the health of justice involved children and adolescents has received increasing attention in Australia and internationally, which in my view is a good thing. Um, domestically, I'm sure people listening in Australia will be aware of the Royal Commission a few years ago in the Northern Territory and youth justice agencies around the country have been looking very hard at their systems and how they're responding to the needs of these very vulnerable young people. Um, internationally, the United Nations uh, Global Study on the Children Deprived of Liberty uh, was an opportunity that we had to draw attention to the health needs of these very vulnerable young people globally. Um, so in the, in the process of that, we, uh, Rowan Borschman led a global review that really uh, showed how poor the health is of these young people. They really are uh, distinguished by complex co-occurring health problems in the context of entrenched and often intergenerational disadvantage. So a very, very vulnerable and complex group of young people indeed. Um, and one other piece of work that preceded this, going back to the notion of data linkage to study uh, uh, health issues in this group was a paper by Kate Van Duren seven years ago now, where we were looking at deaths in people released from prisons. Um, so adults released from prisons in Queensland. So in this particular study, we linked records for about 42,000 uh, people released from prison over a 14 year period with the National Death Index. And what we, lo we looked at is age differences 
in the standardised mortality ratio. In other words, is the increase in risk of death after release from prison compared to other people in the community uh, depending on how old you are or how long you are at the time. So you can see from the graph here, if I just draw your attention to the solid red line, for young women aged 17 to 24 when released from prison, their risk of death after release from prison was about 38 times that um, of their age and sex match peers in the community. Um, for boys or for young men aged 17 to 24, that risk was about 23 times higher than among age and sex match males in the community. And so there's an age gradient here where the increase in risk of death after release from prison is greatest for the youngest people. And that made us wonder, well, what about young people who move through the youth detention system? So in Queensland at the time of this study, 17 year olds were locked up in adult prisons. Um, but what about younger people who also experience detention? The other piece of work that, that informed our what we were doing is uh, two US studies. Neither of these was a data linkage study, but both in using administered data. This one by Arash Noshravani in California looked at reasons for hospitalization for adolescents in that state, a very large sample. Um, and what they found is that adolescents uh, hospitalized from youth detention were very, very disproportionately being hospitalized for mental health related reasons. Um, so that's consistent with what we know about the very poor mental health of these young people. And despite being in detention, um, but more often uh, for trauma compared to young adolescents in the community and obviously less frequently pregnancy, partly because fewer girls experience detention in this age group. So really highlighting the, the very significant mental health burden. Um, another more recent paper by Tyler Winkleman um, looked at national data on uh, hospitalization among justice involved adolescents. And in a nutshell, what it showed is a dose response relationship between contact with the youth justice system and emergency department presentation and hospitalization. So adolescents who've been in some way involved in the youth justice system in the last year were more likely to present to the emergency department, more likely to be hospitalized and spent more time in the hospital. So it's again suggesting a disproportionate burden of morbidity and of associated health service access in these very vulnerable young people. Uh, the only study in Australia that we were aware of in this area, and in fact the only study that I'm aware of that's a large study that's used data linkage to study any health outcome in young people um, prior to our work was this study by Carolyn Coffey uh, now about 17, 18 years ago in Victoria that linked youth justice data for uh, almost 3,000 young people who'd experienced their first custodial episode uh, over that, that period of 1988 to 99. And you can see there that what they found is that the rate of death for young males and particularly for young females was dramatically increased. So a very, very vulnerable group of young people. Uh, quite, a small, um, quite old data now. Um, so we have recently undertaken a study um, and I want to acknowledge both NHMRC and Youth Justice in Queensland who've supported this work, linking youth justice data for all young people in Queensland um, over a very long time, I'll, I'll show you the numbers in a moment, um, and a total of almost 49,000 young people. Uh, so that's our sampling frame, to use the language that Jesse was using before. And our question is, how many of these young people are dying and when and how? And so we've linked those data uh, through three separate data linkage units, and um, which as you can imagine, creates some complexity to uh, find out about their passage through the adult correctional system, the QCS, correctional services data, um, to find out about deaths in this cohort, the, the National Death Index data, and also to get richer information about the causes and circumstances of death in the NCIS, the National Coronial Information System. So really this is a very globally unique study. Uh, here's the sampling frame, and thanks to Jesse for putting this slide together. We've looked at all young people who had a youth justice contact in Queensland from 1993 to 2014. Uh, and then we looked at deaths in the, those young people up until the end of January 2017. So that's our right censoring period. So that's given us the opportunity to look at a large sample, a population sample over a very long period. Um, I won't dwell on the sample. Um, you can find that sort of information publicly. I will share with you this. Uh, 
these are our survival curves, looking at the survival of these young people from the date of their first contact with the youth justice system in the study. You can see that the follow-up time is up to around 8,000 days. So again, quite a long follow-up time. Uh, you can see there are some important differences between males and females and between Indigenous and non-Indigenous young people. And unfortunately, consistent with what we know about adults who move through prison systems, it comes out that in the youth justice system, young Indigenous boys are more likely than any other group to die um, for many cause after release from youth detention or other contact with the youth justice system, at least in Queensland. So it really confirms that we should be very concerned about the well-being of these young people after their contact with the system. We also, just following on the work that Tyler Winkleman has done in the US, had a look at the, the possibility of a dose-response relationship between degree of penetration into the youth justice system and mortality. And what we found, as you can see here, is that those young people who experience detention, that's the blue line, have much worse survival than those who only received a community order, some sort of supervision, who in turn did worse than young people who were charged with a crime but never convicted. So now I'm not suggesting this is necessarily a causal relationship, but it's clearly the case that young people who penetrate most deeply into the youth justice system are also those who are at risk of death from some cause or other after that contact. We calculated standardised mortality ratios, in other words, how much is the risk of death in these young people greater than that of their age and sex matched peers. In the whole cohort, it's 3.3, and what that means is that young people in Queensland, at least, who've had any contact with the youth justice system are more than three times more likely than their peers to die during follow-up, which is obviously a very concerning figure. Uh, and that SMR in our study was the highest for Indigenous girls, who are almost six times more likely um, than girls in the in the community of the same age and sex to die after contact with the justice system. So a great concern also at the population level for closing the gap. In our cohort, around a third of these deaths were due to suicide, um, which is obviously a very tragic outcome and, and broadly consistent with what we know about causes of death for young people in the community. Except the rate of death by suicide. Uh, is so much higher in this group than among young people in the community. And when we look though at the SMR by underlying cause, what we can see is that although a third of the deaths in this cohort is due to suicide, the risk of death from all of the causes that we're looking at here is markedly higher than among other young people in the community. So it's elevated for suicide, for transport accidents, drug-related deaths, overdoses, violence, and also from non-external causes. So um, chronic health-related conditions. So that's the, the initial findings that we have, and thanks to Jesse for a lot of the work on the data and the background for this, um, that shows really beyond a shadow of a doubt now that young people in Australia who've had contact with the youth justice system are at dramatically increased risk of preventable death. So clearly we need to do something, but the question then is what? Um, so what now that is, is where people who've had contact with youth justice are more likely to die, but we have very little idea about what the levers are that we can pull in the community to try to prevent that. So it's still something of a black box. And just very quickly, um, before I pass back to Jesse, uh, we are nevertheless on the way to uh, addressing that situation through data linkage. So one of my other roles as chair of the National Youth Justice Health Advisory Group, and a couple of years ago, um, the AHW published a report that we recommended um, looking at uh, the feasibility of using data linkage to study the health of young justice-involved people. Um, and so just a quote there from the report, it's recommended that a national data collection on the health of young people under youth justice supervision be developed using a combination of data linkage with the Juvenile Justice National Women data set and administrative data. Um, so, on the one hand, we want to find out what happens to young people between contact with youth justice and death, and the other we want to sort of to understand their health. So, we've recently been funded by the NHMRC to do precisely that, and um, we're about a year into working our way through the various approvals from data custodians, the various ethics approvals, and we've received some terrific feedback from the PHRN that's helping us move forward with that at the moment. Uh, and for this study, we are linking national youth justice records back to 
2001. So we estimate that that's going to be around 95,000 records with national hospital, national emergency department, national Medicare, national PBS or, or uh, pharmaceutical claims and national death index records. So this is really, and we hope to have at least the Medicare and PBS data later this year, this will be the first ever glimpse into patterns of healthcare utilization in this population globally. So it's fantastic that we have this opportunity and uh, hopefully I'll be able to come back next year and share some of the findings. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, just in conclusion, I guess uh, our experience in the kind of youth justice sector and the, the adult correctional center, sector and justice health in general is that um, data linkage is a, I think we've established that data linkage is a, is a way to bridge the gap of social exclusion and redress the inequalities um, through generating um, really remarkable um, uh, and concerning uh, evidence that is policy relevant. Um, next slide, please. So just a few take home messages. Um, in our line of work, we've established the accurate linkage of health and justice data is feasible. Um, and we would suggest that routine linkage of non-health data is crucial to understand disadvantaged health inequalities and also evaluate interventions in these groups. Um, Multi-sectoral linkage provides a more accurate view of real expenditure, cost effectiveness, and the potential for unintended consequences in these groups. And because it uses information um, from multiple sectors, uh, multiple government um, departments, it generates evidence that can directly inform a whole of government response, which is very useful. Next slide, please. Um, despite those advantages, uh, as you can see here, uh, it's a um, study done by Angela Young and Felicity Flack. Um, basically, they reviewed uh, the total number of publication involving multi-sectoral linked data sources, um, and that is in, gray, in the lighter gray uh, versus just health-only linkage. And as you can see, um, it you know multi-sectoral data in Australia, data linkage in Australia is still fairly rare, um, despite the advantages that we've illustrated. Um, so hopefully. Um, that starts to um, improve and access to that those types of multi-sectoral um, data sources starts to improve. Next slide, please. I'd just like to um, end on a bit of a quote here from Michael Marmot, um, and this is in the Inclusion Health series. He, he stated that, uh, quote, we need the involvement of society as a whole to tackle the causes of the causes of social exclusion and its dramatic health consequences. This approach might save money and it's the right thing to do. Next slide. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that may, may arise. Thank you so much, Stuart and Jesse. That was a fantastic presentation and a really wonderful overview of what can be achieved um, if you're able to link a wide range of data. Um, so if anybody would like to ask a question, you can write your question in the question box. Um, we already have a few questions that have come in. So um, the first one is uh, someone who's very interested in the finding related to the disproportionate mortality rates for young incarcerated individuals. I understand that this SMR was for age and sex matched individuals. Were there differences in comorbidity profiles which may account for this very high SMR? I don't know who wants to take that one. Yep. Go Stuart. Um, okay, so I, I need to just, Clarified ratios, and in that particular paper, if you look it up, Kate Van Doren's paper from ANZ Journal of Public Health, 2013, the the crude mortality rate goes the other way. In other words, the, the the crude rate of death is lowest in younger people, 
and highest in older people, which makes perfect sense. But that's obviously also true in the community and the standardised mortality ratio went the other way. In other words, the elevation in risk is greatest for young people and least for older people. So what we're seeing here is that young people are still less likely to die after release from prison than are older people, but that protective effect of being young is much less for people who've been in prison than for other young people. So they look a bit more like older people, basically. Um, we didn't have data in that study on their comorbidities. Um, we do have very good data on the health conditions that people in prison experience, and Jesse's now on the National Prison Health Information Committee and might be able to comment on some of that. But we talk about cause and again, side overdose and injury are by far and away the leading causes, and of course, all of those are at least theoretically preventable. Okay, and there's a sort of follow-up to that one, is uh, this person is also wondering whether the reference population for the calculation of SMRs was derived from your own cohort or using published data on the entire Australian population? That particular one was using uh, Queensland population data from the ABS. Okay, and here's a perhaps simple, perhaps not for Jesse. Um, what do you consider non-health data? <laughs> That's, that's a very uh, perceptive comment. Um, I, I would suggest, given our knowledge of the social determinants of health, um, and you know, I guess we could debate on what is a social determinant to the nth degree, but I, I don't personally really see a distinction because the environment that we um, grow and live in is fundamentally related to health. Um, in fact, I don't think you can really um, disentangle the two. So. I personally consider, um, that's why I put non-health data in quotations there, um, I personally consider um, most sources of data somewhat health related um, anyway. So I don't actually uh, think the distinction between health and non-health data is particularly useful given all we know about the social determinants of health and things, you know, the impact of things like education, um, employment, um, incarceration and other things, housing. Cool. Uh, next question is, uh, well, there's a couple of more sort of technical ones and maybe you can run them both together. So one is about how do you link data from disparate sources? And the other is how did you find accessing of linked data? So you might wanna answer those all in one. Who wants to take that one? And we don't have all day. Yes. I'll go, I'll go first, then you go second, Jelly. Um, sure. It, it depends on the source. A lot of our linkage has been through the AHW whenever we've been involved in Commonwealth data. Um, when it's been state only, it's been typically through the PHRN node in that jurisdiction, um, whether that's WA or Queensland or elsewhere. Um, the second half of it, Jesse, maybe you be better place to comment. On. Well, uh, I guess the question, one of the questions pertinent here is how, how do you link data? Um, and, and those agencies, make a determination about what's the most effective way to link data and it's also about what information you can provide to the data linkage node or the approved linking authority. Um, so sometimes they conduct what's called deterministic uh, linkage which is essentially um, on a unique identifying number or string of numbers or so, such and the like. Um, another way of linking data is probabilistic. So that's where you have information about an individual, usually name, sex, date of birth, et cetera, um, where you provide um, those uh, information uh, sources to the data linkage node, and then they generate what's called a probability of a true match based on that information. Um, and uh, it's very accurate, the probabilistic linkage um, in Australia. Um, and so there's basically two ways to go about it, but both um, can achieve very highly accurate um, linkage. Oops, and I'll just very briefly add to that point. I was just going to add to that. Uh, one of the things that we know in Australia is that adding aliases, all known permutations of name, sex, date of birth to linkage is particularly important for inclusion health populations. So Holly Thiel led a paper on the data that I presented showing that it increases sensitivity of linkage quite dramatically. And what that means is that if we don't include aliases, we're probably attenuating inclusion health for 10 years of being disadvantaged on mortality and morbidity. 
Yeah. And and just to add that, I think there's two other things there. One is the question was about um, uh, the process of data linkage in Australia. Um, I, I won't sugarcoat it. it. It is a complex area. There's ethical approval. There's data custodian oversight and approval. Um, and often the sources that we're presenting here are a product of years of effort, um, not just months or <laughs> days. Um, so it, it, it really is uh, a very um, resource intensive area at times. Um, that doesn't mean that we should, um, you know, kind of lapse into the soft bigotry of low expectations and we should pursue and, and, and because this research is very important um, because it does ad address fundamental inequality. So it's a very important component of doing this research. Um, and, and secondly, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, it's so important to have your study design mapped out before you even engage in considering linking any of these, these pieces of information, because data linkage does not supplant good study design. In fact, you can do, um, you can wind up with something that's not usable if you don't understand research study design going into this whole process. And you're going to waste your a lot of your time if you don't get that sorted first before then going on to the process of actually acquiring uh, the data sources that you need to do this work. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> we that's something that we find a lot in the data linkage units and the PHRN that often we're approached and people want approval for a study that is not well designed yet. And it's very hard for us to even understand what services we can provide if you don't have a good basic study design to start with. So that's really helpful. Um, one final question, um, which is, what do you believe are the main obstacles to multi-sectoral data linkage in research in Australia? You probably alluded to a few of them already. <laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> uh, you've got three minutes. <laughs> Um, sure, do you want to go quickly and uh, yeah. take us home? Um, I, the one, the key one for me, I mean, it's, it's complex. Um, it's, you know, we're all working to try to increase efficiency. We, it, that would be worth talking about. The one thing I want to draw attention to is the critical importance of engaging with non-health data custodians, both to maximise the quality of the data and to help them recognise the value of data linkage and that engaging with the external researchers in that way is not the, the sky is not going to fall in. It's actually a really good thing to do. Um, privacy can it, and that research can generate very useful policy relevant information. So we need some culture change to try to bring those custodians in so that they recognise that their data are part of an integral whole of government collection that it can inform policy. I, Jesse, I mean I don't have to... I don't have much to add. I, I, I would say that um I totally agree with Stuart's point there. I think it's a lot to do with relationship building with data custodians. Um, I think it's also being very clear in one, your study design and what you think the positive, you know, the benefits are, um, not only from your perspective or a research perspective, but also from a translational perspective. I think that's probably, you know, where the data custodians really kind of can latch on to things. Um, I, I would also say that it, it's important for people in this area to have a clear distinction of you know what would be kind of you know ethical concerns versus you know um, what data custodians are looking for um, and often those two things are conflated and that's just the reality of the um, the kind of environment we currently have and hopefully that you know those kind of delineations get a little clearer as we you know it evolves but um, it's important for the you know you as a researcher to really have a, a clear delineation of that and know um, you know not only in the national statement on ethics but also you know get an idea of what the concerns from a data custodian perspective are um, so that you can clearly communicate um, and alleviate those concerns if they arise. Well, thank you so much. It's time to wrap up now. Um, so thank you everybody for attending and once again, thank you so much to Stuart and Jesse for a fabulous presentation and we might take you up on your offer to come back again next year and let us know where you're up to. That would be fantastic.
Um, I'd also like to remind you that next week we have uh, Melissa O'Donnell who's going to be talking about using linked data to provide evidence for improved policy and support for vulnerable children and families. So that's next week. So hopefully we'll see you all again next week. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you.